All right, so this past week, the sermon and Sunday school lesson from last week got deleted by accident. I thought that I, I had to place some magical shells with the storage on my hard drives. I thought that I had copied the message and the Sunday school last week to my hard drive, and so I formatted the card so that we would have room for this week and then realized it was not where I thought it was. So I don't know other than writing something down. I'm not sure how I could have avoided that one, but that is totally on me. It was a mistake. So that said, I'm going to do a quick recap of last week because one, it never hurts to recover that material. And two, for anybody that is watching at home or online, um, at least they'll have some covering from last week. So the updated sheet here with the five on it, the little like town graphic, that's the updated one. Throw out your old one so you don't get confused because I didn't realize when I copied that one that it, it had five steps instead of four. Um, so just as a quick reminder, the textbook that I learned this from, there were four steps, they added a fifth step. Uh, technically, they added step four and bumped what was four to five. Um, it's a good change. It's something that they used to do after the fact and now it's part of the process. So I think that's a good change, but that was why I didn't even notice that it was missing previously because I saw four and I'm like, okay, good. Um, then on this sheet with the circles, um, this is what we're going to cover today until we get to our passage in Joshua. So you can actually follow along with me today. Normally I don't have time to type things out, but since I didn't have those two videos to edit, I had a little extra time this week. So, um, um, so we're just going to start at the top. Um, I, I did cover this last week, and those of you that were here, you wrote it down. But again, since I had time to type it out, I went ahead. So let's just cover the criteria for formulating a theological principle. The principle should be reflected in the text. The principle should be timeless and not tied to a specific situation. The, the principle should not be culturally bound since principles are for all Christians at all times. And remember, I told you guys, the, the, the thing that resonates in my head the most about a th theological principle is the part that I have in parentheses there. It has to apply to all Christians at all times, or it's an application that we're reading, not a principle. Um, the principles, oh, apparently I missed a word there, should correspond to the teaching of the rest of Scripture. So just insert the word should there, I missed that. Then the last one, the principle, again, should be relevant to both the biblical audience and the contemporary audience. So, all right, you've got that. When you're doing step three, make sure that whatever you're writing down as your theological principle meets those criteria. If it doesn't, it's not a principle, it's something else. If you get that wrong, everything else from here is wrong. All right, step number four, consult the biblical map. The question is, does our theological principle fit within the rest of the Bible? Not why does it or however the book originally worded it. Um, the question should be, does it fit with the rest of the Bible? We should not assume that we're right at this point. We still need to do some checks and balances, which the irony of the way they worded this in the book is that's the whole point of adding step four. So they kind of missed the boat on that one, whoever edited this uh, textbook. Um, and then, of course, I have there at the bottom, since God is the ultimate author and the one who inspires Scripture, he will not contradict himself. So, I mean, that's just a good basic check because we have two choices as a Christian. Either the Bible is entirely true because God inspired it, and therefore there are no errors, and I'm not talking about blind faith. I'm saying either it really is completely true because God is the author, or... There are problems in it, and if there are problems, the question becomes, how do we know what we can and can't trust? If the Bible does contradict itself somewhere, well, how do I know which passages I can trust at that point? I can't. So if we are trying to formulate something that is a principle, that means that we are saying, we are declaring that God is teaching us this principle through Scripture. Well, if it contradicts the rest of Scripture, it's either you or God, and guess who's going to win? It's not you. It's not me. All right. Um, then in bold below that, it says, during this step, you must enter the parts whole spiral. Now, the graphic below is not a spiral. 
I know that is groundbreaking news, but this is not a spiral, this is concentric circles. But I couldn't find a good graphic of the spiral, and this is close enough. Um, so technically, the spiral starts in one place, slowly spirals out like a cinnamon roll, okay? Um, that sounds good now. Um, but the idea is you're starting in one specific spot and you're working your way out. So whether it's a spiral or concentric circles doesn't really matter. The point is you have to start with the immediate word or words, branch out just a little bit to the sentence, the paragraph, maybe a fragment of a paragraph if you're reading Paul especially, and then the broader context from there. Um, now, I will say that I disagree with the person, and, and this graphic actually comes from a book called The Hermeneutical Spiral, and I couldn't find a graphic. Maybe I missed it. Um, but anyway, I, I disagree with where they put Bible and genre. If you look on the very outer edges, I disagree with that. And this is a major scholar, so I say that with humility, a lot of humility, because it's one of these moments where I'm like, am I crazy? Maybe I am. But I think that throughout the general teaching of hermeneutics, which is the study that we're doing, you have to respect genre first, then the rest of the Bible. So maybe it's just been long enough since I've read that passage and he qualifies, or sorry, that chapter in that book, and he qualifies it somewhere, I'm not sure. Um, but I would say that you need to go then from genre to Bible, not Bible to genre. But we are splitting hairs at that point. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> the other thing is, bear in mind that when it comes to what we're talking about right now, what I just covered, we're going to cover that much more in depth later on. So like I mentioned last week, if you aren't following this or it's just kind of vague, you're like, okay, Aaron, I kind of get what you're saying, but I'm not sure what to do with this. Don't worry about it. We're going to get there later. I just want you to have a preview of what's upcoming. And that's also why he put it in the book this way. So any questions on that front page? Okay. And by the way, it is okay to, you know, raise your hand or something if you have a question. Um, all right, so step number five, we're finally into the fifth step, which on your laminated copy is directly in the middle, number two, the interpretive journey. So we are finally on step five. Finally, you matter, because in steps one, two, three, and four, you do not matter, you do not get a vote, you don't have to exist for steps one, two, three, and four to happen. But in step five, finally, you matter. This is where it finally comes home to how can I use this or how can we as a church understand and apply what we're reading. So step five, now we get to the question of how do I apply the meaning which is found in the principle to my life? How do individual Christians today apply this principle? That's the question that we should be asking in step five. Application comes from meaning. Application comes from meaning. Through the principles that we um, discovered in step three. So this is why that old Sunday school question, what does the text mean to you, is such a wrong question. Because there are four steps that should have taken place already. And again, this isn't understand that this textbook is not a proposal for how to understand Scripture. What this textbook is, is a statement of communication in the way that human beings communicate. The idea of hermeneutics is not only in theological, or in theological education. If you've met, ever met an English major, they have to take hermeneutics. If you do a linguistic study, in-depth study in a foreign language, whether they call it hermeneutics or not, you will learn hermeneutics. All this is, is basic human communication. This is the way that we communicate and the way that we receive information. So understand, I'm not saying this is God's inspired word by any means, it's not. It's, it's a human author that is coming up with a system but what this human author is describing is related to the image of God in the way that we communicate it is universal. So in other words, it's not optional. 
You will do these things whether you realize it or not. The question is how well will you do them? For example, the old uh, thing about algebra, when am I ever going to use this in real life? And to a large degree, you won't. You know, and I, I have to chuckle because like you guys, I grew up in the generation where the teacher probably said something like, you won't have a calculator all the time when you're an adult. <laughs> right? But here's the thing. I may not use algebra. I may not use the actual formulas on a daily basis in a conscious way. But have you guys ever seen one of those graphics, like the cat that's going to jump from one counter to the other, or maybe from the floor to the top of the counter, and somebody actually draws out all the mathematics that are required for that cat to simply jump from one spot to the other? Do you realize the mathematical equations that are represented simply by you reaching up and scratching your nose or your head? There is so much math going on there, it is ridiculous. But we don't think about it because it's intuitive. It's just something we do as humans. The same thing as, you know, I, I struggled in pre-algebra. I really did. Because I'm, I'm a straightforward person. I can play chess, but I don't prefer to play games. I prefer to get to the heart of the matter. In algebra, you first learn something along the lines of uh, 5 plus x equals 9. And I'm like, okay, the answer's obvious. Why do I have to go through all of this stuff? And unfortunately, the first teacher that I had couldn't explain why. They just said, well, because you have to. Well, that's not good enough for me. That's not how I'm wired. I can't accept that answer. Later, I learned some of the reasons and so on and so on. But my point is, we do these things intuitively without thinking about it. And it's the same thing when it comes to following these steps. We do these things whether we realize it or not. The question is, and the point in all of that, is the more you realize that you do it, the better you become at it, hopefully, right? I mean, imagine having to do a, a mathematical equation on that cat to figure out how that cat can jump from one thing to the other. My math skills don't go that far, yet I can watch a cat and tell you whether or not it's going to make it most of the time, because experience has taught me that, and my brain does all of that without me having to think about it. All right, hopefully that makes sense. I don't want to get uh, bogged down in that too far. So real quick, let's take a uh, review, the interpretive journey, still on the same sheet of paper, the handout. So step one, grasp the text in their town. What did the text mean to the original audience? In this, you need to use past tense third person language, right? We, she, he, they. It needs to be third person language. What did the text mean to the original audience? Use past tense third person language. You don't matter yet, okay? So that example, or for example, we, doesn't apply yet in a biblical passage because you and I are not part of that original audience. Step number two, measure the width of the river to cross. What are the differences between the biblical audience and us? Also note the similarities, but the differences are more important as those will show us the difference between application within the text and the principle behind the application. And I hope that that sentence makes sense because we covered it and we're going to cover it again when we get more in depth in this. But similarities are important. We talked about that previously, right? What are the similarities between us and uh, the audience for the church at Rome, right? We are all in the New Testament. We all believe in Jesus at this point, assuming we're talking about genuine Christians. So those are important for us to understand. But the differences are what's going to make the, the ability to understand what the principle is. If all we focus on is similarities, we're not seeing principle, we're seeing application. Okay? Just like that example that I gave you guys when we first started the study about the uh, guy that overhears the couple at the restaurant next to him, they're talking about buying a house, and he's like, oh, okay, she said to go for it, so he went and bought a house and then thought his wife would be proud right? He wasn't part of that conversation. 
So if all he was doing is focusing on the similarities, right? Oh, that husband and wife are talking about buying a house. That wife said that it's okay, therefore it's okay in my family. That's what happens when you focus on the similarities. So it's not that similarities are not important, but that can't be your focus. What he should have done is focused on the differences. Oh, that's not my wife. I'm not that guy. We're not talking about the same house. We're not talking about the same budget. We're maybe even not talking about the same timing because that's not my wife and we haven't agreed yet. Focusing on the differences are what's going to lead you to the principle. Remember, we are often reading an author's application of a biblical principle to a specific group of people. So we have to figure out the principle that underlies or is behind that application, which is why the differences are so important. Any question on that one? Because that's an easy one to miss, and it will derail you faster than a blowout on the interstate. Okay? All right, step three, cross the principalizing bridge. What is the theological principle in the text? This needs to be your question. Remember, an accurate theological principle will be true for all Christians at all times, regardless of culture, language, time, etc. All the differences that we covered in step number two. Step number four, consult the biblical map. How does our theological principle fit with the rest of Scripture? Now, if you have ever wondered how some Bible teachers or fellow Christians get off on some really messed up biblical ideas, right here, step number four. They never cross-check it with the rest of Scripture. They cherry-pick a passage or they have some uh, subjective experience. Maybe they had a dream or indigestion that night. And all of a sudden, they firmly believe that God has told them X, Y, or Z, and then they go find Scripture that seems to back up what they say, even though it is screaming out of context. This is how? Because it's never cross-checked with Scripture. See, if you want to know in that example of the husband that decided to buy the house without his wife's permission or agreement, if you want to know how he went wrong, it's because he didn't stop. One, he focused on the similarities. Two, he didn't stop to check it against his own marriage. Does that fit within the way that their marriage works? Let's paint another scenario. Let's change it. Maybe that guy is an investment guy, and he buys and sells properties for his job. And he hears this couple talking about a new upcoming neighborhood. Maybe he wasn't thinking he wanted to buy their house. Maybe he wasn't thinking he wanted to buy his house. His job is to buy and sell properties. Well, in that case, maybe it would be appropriate for him to buy a house without talking to his wife, because it's not their money and not their home. That's his job. See, does that make sense how the same scenario can play out completely differently because your context is different? Same thing with Scripture. If we don't check it against the rest of Scripture, we're going to be off somewhere. And it saddens me listening. It's, it's hard for me, honestly, for, for the most part. Most TV preachers, it's hard for me to listen to them. Because a lot of the really famous ones, there's a few really good ones, but most of the really good ones I find on podcasts more than I find on TV. Now, let me also qualify, we don't have cable. I'm not, this isn't like, you know, the super pastor, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not the super spiritual, ooh, we don't have cable. I mean, we're just cheap and we're not paying for it. Um, so there are more preachers available if you have cable, but I'm just talking like when you turn on some of the normal broadcast ones. A lot of those guys are really off, and it's painful to listen to the way that they teach Scripture. Um, so be careful who you listen to. And like I told you guys before, after we're finished with this study, you're going to be fighting some arrogance in, in the way that you listen to things. Now, hopefully your heart is more prepared for this than a lot of people. A lot of times when people go through this textbook, they're much younger, both physically and in their faith. So hopefully you've got the maturity. But remember, the Bible also tells us knowledge puffs up. And when we start understanding the right way to understand Scripture, 
it's really easy to then become a critique, a, a judge, right? Like the people that hold up the signs, you know, that was a 10, that was a two, whatever. It's really easy to start doing that. And we do need to be careful, we need to be discerning, but we don't need to be judgmental. So there's a fine line there. All right, consult the biblical map. Um, Remember, God is the ultimate author, the one who inspires Scripture. He will not contradict himself. So if you've got something that you think is right and you find other passages in Scripture that say something else, then you're probably wrong. 99% you're wrong. The other possibility is it's something called an apparent contradiction. And I think we've talked about this at least once or twice since I've been here, but I can't remember whether that was from the pulpit or where it was, but an apparent, yeah, I have, um, an apparent contradiction is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that appears to contradict itself, but it doesn't. For example, the example that I have used in every church, and this one is no exception, um, if I pick a certain room or few in this church, are those storage rooms or Sunday school rooms? See, when I ask that question and demand to answer, I'm setting you up to give me a false answer because the room is theoretically dedicated to Sunday school, but it's functionally used for storage. Could the stuff be moved out of it and used for Sunday school again? Absolutely. Should it? Yeah. (laughs) I'm not saying we don't need storage, and I'm I'm derailing a little bit and going to make you all mad, but... When we have more rooms that are used to store stuff than we do that are prepared for people to come to our church, there's a problem. We should be preparing for people to come and make sure that we have lots of space and people to minister to them rather than just storing stuff and storing it and storing it and storing it. Um, But that's a major aside. So be careful if you find something that you think you know and you check it against Scripture elsewhere. If it appears to contradict, it probably does. But there are instances, the example I've given you guys before, the idea of the lion. Who is the lion in Scripture? Depends on which passage you're talking about. That's an apparent contradiction. Or the classic one, does God choose us or do we choose Him? Well, the Bible affirms both. So we need to be really careful not to make a distinction where the Bible doesn't. The Bible affirms both, and I'm definitely not getting into that today. All right, step five, grasp the text in our town. How should individual Christians today live out the theological principle? Here, we need to use present tense personal pronouns. So now this would be me, I, we, us. First person, personal pronouns. From here, it's a matter of obedience. See, once we understand what the text says, we now choose whether to obey God or not. And it really is that simple. If we find through studying Scripture that what we are doing doesn't square with what the Bible tells us to do, Do we redefine the Bible or do we fix the problem and change what we're doing so that it matches Scripture? That's the Captain Obvious answer. Everybody knows that one, even though some of us are like, yeah, I don't like it, but yeah, we need to fix it, right? What about within the church? If we run across things within the church that are not being done according to Scripture, do we just go, well, we've always done it this way? Well, you know, we just really feel like it's better to do it this way. Or do we say, oh, we've been contradicting Scripture and we should probably fix this so that we're honoring God? I'm challenging you guys, think about what we do and whether or not it matches Scripture, both as individuals and as a church. From here, it is a matter of obedience. Once we know what God expects, we are obligated to obey, and not to do so is sin. And the very first time I taught this study, many, many years ago now, um, I, I used, I didn't have the textbook at the time, I just had a basic outline. And I built that outline against long range shooting or around the idea of long range shooting. 
And I'll pull that analogy in right now because I think this is really important. The, the more you follow these steps, it's like having a gun that can shoot a long distance, whether you call it a hunting rifle, a sniper rifle, because in my background, I call it a sniper rifle. Um, but the more you follow these steps, that's like getting your scope dialed in so that you know at a certain number of yards, your bullet is going to impact at a specific location. So each of these steps helps you dial in the accuracy of your scope and firearm. And then when you get to the end, if you want to hit your intended target, what do you need to do? Yeah, pull the trigger, or for the gun nuts, squeeze the trigger, right? You've already got everything lined up. You've already chosen your target. Everything's done, you just need to pull the trigger. And it's the same thing here. After that, it is your responsibility to pull the trigger. But here's the caveat, or not really caveat, here's something to think about. What if one of my holy cows is in the scope? What if, what if as I go through scripture, it defines one of the things that I hold dear and says, oh, that's not honoring to God? What do I do? Pull the trigger. Right? What if through this study I find out that I am a horrible, sinful wretch? What do I do? Pull the trigger, right? What if I find out my pastor's a heretic? Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. Maybe a little faster on that one, right? <laughs> Maybe put a follow up shot or two, right? <laughs> Here's the thing, if you have done your job in the first four steps, it doesn't matter who or what the bullet hits, because if you have aimed true, then God has given you that target. If you have done your job, then Scripture, who, which is inspired by God, chose that target. So it's not a matter of you saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a church that I served in a long time ago, and um, one of the higher ranking members, like I don't even know how to word that, it doesn't sound bad, it just was. It was a horrible situation. One of the more influential members in that church um, was just off, I mean, just wicked. Like, to the point that... He, he put out an open letter offering $40,000 to anybody that would get rid of the pastor. I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. I still have the copy of the letter. I'm not, I'm not likely to show you, but I still have it in case anything ever comes up. $40,000, how would you interpret that? Right? When this was brought before the equivalent of the leaders in that church, which I say that lightly, the statement was, well, we're not going to kick a man while he's down. He's just struggling right now. So you're telling me that somebody who is flagrantly violating Scripture, threatening the pastor at whatever level you want to interpret that, you're telling me that the biblical response is just to say, well, we got to love him anyway, and we're not going to hurt somebody that's already struggling. Interesting. See, that is an unwillingness to pull the trigger. That is somebody that is staring Scripture in the face and is not willing to pull the trigger. What if it's your best friend, though? I would have said, what if it's your spouse? But some of us would like to pull the trigger on our spouse sometimes. So what if it's your best friend? It doesn't matter. See, we will never grow in Christ if we are not willing to have the hard conversations, if we are not willing to hold each other accountable to Scripture, go home tonight. Don't use Google because you're going to get a lot of articles. 
But go home tonight if you have a concordance or go to something like BibleHub.com. BibleHub is one of my favorite online resources for the Bible. Um, it's just pretty non, no nonsense. It's literally BibleHub.com. Um, just, just for a quick reference of scripture, it's one of my favorites. Um, and um, you version is my favorite app right now, just because it's no nonsense. There's no extra stuff. It's just give me scripture. Um, but go to Bible Hub and type in the phrase one another or some combination thereof, whether it's one word or two or hyphenated, I can't remember. See how many other, see how many times in scripture that we are commanded to do something for or with one another, specifically in the New Testament especially. See, we are called to hold each other accountable. We are called to encourage one another so long as it is today, right? Keep going and keep going. You're going to find lots of examples. Then after you've done that, then you can do your Google search, the one another's of scripture. And you're going to find all kinds of articles where people are giving you scripture after scripture after scripture about how we're supposed to hold each other accountable. But this is where so many churches fail. There is no biblical accountability. There is no, well, the Bible says this and we're doing this, so we need to fix it. Instead, it becomes... Well, we've always done it this way, or, well, sister so-and-so has been in that position, or brother so-and-so has been in that position for years, and even though clearly the Bible is indicating that person's not qualified or fit to serve, they've been doing that for years, so we should just let it go because they're our friend. It's God or you. You choose. Can't have both. See? We, as the song says, we find ourselves when we lose ourselves in him. That's the hard reality of what God has called us to. And that is the hard reality that a good study of the Bible points us to. So again, the question, and now I'm just flat out preaching, what are we going to do? Do we live in mediocrity and disobedience? Or do we ruffle some feathers and obey God? All right, so those are the five steps. Let me do a quick time check. I think we're good. Yeah, we're still good. Okay, so let me just read through this. Um, I'm going to read a short passage and then re read through the five steps just as an example. And then uh, next time we will start um, how to read the book. So that'll be step number three on your laminated outline is what we'll start next week. All right, so in Joshua 1, 1 through 9, feel free to flip there. I'm just going to start reading, though. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. We have mentioned several times, and this is the author of the book talking about this. You and I have not really addressed this passage yet. Um, we have mentioned Joshua 1, 1 through 9 several times already. Let's make the formal trip from this Old Testament passage to life today to illustrate how the interpretive journey works. The passage is as follows. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. How's that for fanfare? Yep, he's dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, most of us have heard this part and the next verse before. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. I had somebody give me that passage when I graduated seminary. I thought it was highly ironic because it's screaming out of context in the way they meant it. Um, they meant well. Don't get, don't get me wrong. Um, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all my law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you will be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful." 
have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. By the way, when I read, then you'll be prosperous and, and successful, what mental picture came to your mind? Mm -hmm. So I, I fall to the same thing. But what does that mean about the way that we're interpreting the Bible? What was God in this context telling him he would be successful to do? Conquer to conquer the land. It wasn't about, it, it, this wasn't a promise to be rich. It was a promise to inherit the land, right? But I've read it that way too. Just now I'm like, oh, I caught myself, right? Because we want to skip straight to step five. That wasn't even the promise given to them, much less the promise given to me. All right, let's move on because we don't have time for me to get into all that. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. All right, so we can't skip to step five as much as we all want to skip to step five. So step one, what did the text mean to the biblical audience? The Lord commanded Joshua, so this is, this is important. I'm not saying anything about me yet. It's not about me. The Lord commanded Joshua, the new leader of Israel, to draw strength and courage from God's empowering presence, to be obedient to the law of Moses, and to meditate on the law so that he would be successful in the conquest of the promised land. See, that would be an example of what you would need to write out in response to the question, what did the text mean to the biblical audience? So I'm going to be honest with you. This process is painfully slow when you first start doing it. But I would encourage you, take a section of Scripture and write out the five steps. Because the more you do it, the more you will be able to be good at it and do it quicker. And then eventually you won't need to actually physically write it out most of the time. All right, step two. What are the differences between the biblical audience and us? So that's the question. So now you would write out on your own free thinking in your, in your theoretical free time, what are the differences? So you'd write them out. An example would be, we are not the leaders of the nation of Israel, although some of us may be leaders in the church. We are not embarking on the conquest of Canaan, the promised land. We are not under the old covenant law. Fair enough. Step number three, what is the theological principle in the text? And this can vary. This is an example, right? Your exact wording will vary. The principle won't. So understand that. To be effective in serving God and successful in the task to which he has called us, we must draw strength and courage from his presence. We must also be obedient to God's word, meditating on it constantly. Okay? So now the question is, does that sound like a fair principle from that passage? I think it's slightly long, slightly awkwardly worded, but is that fair? Well, that's the whole point of step number four. How does our theological principle fit with the rest of Bible and, or the Bible? And remember, I hate the way that he words this. It's not how does it, because the assumption is that it does. The question is, does it fit? The rest of the Bible consistently affirms that God's people can draw strength and courage from his presence. In the New Testament, believers experience God's presence through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit rather than through his presence in the tabernacle. Likewise, throughout both the Old and New Testament, God's people are exhorted to pay close attention and be obedient to his word. So, does that principle, even though maybe it's a little odd in the way that he worded it, does that square with the rest of Scripture? Yeah, we're supposed to draw strength and encouragement from God's presence. Absolutely. Step number five, now we matter. How should individual Christians today live out the theological principles? There are numerous possible applications. Spend more time meditating on God's Word by listening to Christian music as you ride in your car. I prefer that that wasn't the first one that he wrote here, but that's a possible illustration, right? What are you filling your mind with is the question. And by the way, I'm not somebody that thinks it's wrong to listen to secular music. It's perfectly fine. The question is, what is your diet? Is most of the stuff that you intake 
going to honor God or is most of the stuff that you intake not going to honor God? For example, one of the things that scares me in this entire pandemic, and, and if I'm stepping on your toes, personally I'm sorry, but biblically I'm not. What scares me is that through most of this pandemic and election cycle, people have things like CNN on 24 hours a day. When I go visit people, and I know there are most of the people that I'm visiting right now are lonely, and they, I, I, when I was single, I had the TV on for company. I get it. But what are you choosing to fill your mind with? Because I'm telling you right now, CNN is not a source for godly information. Now, they may or may not be a reliable news story. I'm not getting into the politics of that. But what I'm telling you is, any media source, especially in modern America, makes money by stirring the pot. The more they can get people upset, the more money they make. So they're designed, all of them are designed to stoke fear. And we wonder why our society is so afraid. What are you filling your mind with? There's nothing wrong with watching the news, but watch it with a biblical understanding and don't let that be the majority of your diet. There's nothing wrong with listening to secular music, but what are you filling your mind with on a regular basis? All right, again, I'm off to preaching. If God calls you, so more potential applications, if God calls you to a new scary ministry such as teaching fourth grade Sunday school, then be strengthened and encouraged by his empowering presence. Be obedient, keeping a focus on the scriptures. You know, I'm going to throw this one out. As God, not if God, as God leads you to have biblical conversations, whether that's witnessing or whether that's holding people accountable, as God calls you to have biblical conversations with people, take comfort that as you honor God, His presence is with you. Now, as Christians, of course, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but He will be with you. He will provide what you need in that moment. God will do the work. You just have to be a willing vessel. That is a perfectly acceptable application of that passage. Any questions on that? I have a question, and I, don't, mm -hmm. I really don't know how I'm going to word this, um, mm -hmm. so forgive me. So I, I hear in this passage, 1 through you know, 9, that he's shown God to be shown great. And I want to be careful because I know you said, you know, it's not about how I interpret it, it's mm -hmm. not about endless. But the, I'm going to then say, now the way I, the way I see this is I see God has told Joshua to be shown great. He hasn't necessarily told me, like, he might tell me, you know what, shut your mouth and be quiet. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I get out of this isn't so much be strong and courageous, it's listen to God and do what he tells you to do. Um, because I might be arrogant, and so God may not want me to be the one that's being strong and courageous. So listen, he might want me to be humble and listen. You know? Someone said be strong and courageous, but to listen to God's will. That's true. I, I, I get that. I guess, I, I guess, I don't know, what, I, I want to be careful that does that go against what you have always said that it doesn't matter what it means to you? Am I, am I taking that too far by saying that, saying that's what it means to me? No, what you're doing is you're skipping step four. Okay. But what you're asking is the most appropriate question I could ask you to ask. All right. So in other words, the fact that you're saying God hasn't told me to be strong and courageous is 100% accurate. Yeah. And it brings a smile to my face that you even think to ask that question. Yeah. Um, because God has not commanded me to be strong and courageous in that passage. Yeah. Step four, where we go to the rest of Scripture, is the idea of be strong and courageous to accomplish God's will, which is how I would summarize that principle. Um, does that fit with the rest of Scripture that when you are trying to follow God, you should be strong and courageous, not because you are anything, but because you're doing God's will in His way? Yeah, I do. It does. So you are 100% accurate in asking that question, and that really brings a smile to my heart and my face because most people would miss that one. They'd go, okay, we're not, we're not conquering the land. Okay, yeah, but still, I'm going to be strong and courageous, and I don't matter yet. 
but in your application, and that's what I should have said, in application, if, if you ended that passage feeling that there's nothing you can get out of that in your personal life, then that would mean that you skipped step four, which means step five can't happen. Because there are lots of other places where God... So on one hand, there is nowhere in Scripture where God specifically commands me, Aaron Hawk, to be strong and courageous. It doesn't exist because God did not write the Bible specifically to me. But what we do in step four is we see that throughout all of Scripture, when God tells somebody to do something, he encourages them to lean into him for strength and courage. Therefore, it is the be strong and courageous, but not because I, like you said, well, maybe I'm an arrogant jerk and I need to be humble, right? Well, that would be wrapped up in doing it according to God's will. So that's just where as you cross it with other scriptures, you'll come to that application. Yeah, but again, excellent question. I'm glad that you asked. And there is, there is a balance there, and that's why I'm glad that they did add step four, because you can, you can carry it, and you are not, but you can carry it too far to where the whole Bible becomes meaningless because you realize it wasn't written directly to me. Well, if none of it applies to me, then why did God give it to us? You know, so there's a balance there, but ask that question first, and then in step four, that's where you figure out the direction that you can take for application. Good question. All right, any others? I think I've got a minute. Barely, but yeah. All right. Somebody willing to close us in prayer? All right, Father, I just thank you for the day. I pray that you would be with us. And God, it is, it is a humbling task to try and understand your word and to try and apply it into our lives. And Father, it's, it's so easy in some ways and yet so easy to mess up in others. And Lord, I just thank you for hearts and minds that want to understand what you command and what you are saying, no matter what, with no compromise. And that we want to honor you, we want to obey you. And Lord, I thank you for that. I pray that you would grow that within each of our hearts and our minds and help us, God, to have the wisdom to be able to apply things in the proper way and help us to be also willing to put in the hard work. Father, we thank you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name, amen.